London South East Town Hall meeting where we collect your questions and put them to Sean Day, Managing Director of Greatland Gold. Thank you very much indeed for attending. Our March Greatland Gold Town Hall webinar is being broadcast live to hundreds of Greatland Gold investors right now. In a moment, Sean will uh, talk us through the latest Greatland Gold slide presentation and he'll give us a, an operational update on Haveron, as well as the latest on Greatland's very active exploration activities and Sean's perspective now that Haveron and Telfer have been put up for sale by Newmont. And now here's Sean with a short slide presentation followed by our live Q&A. Welcome, Sean. Oh, thanks very much, Donald. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you today and thanks very much for hosting the event. I'll try to be relatively brief uh, through the slideshow so we can move on to the, to the much loved question and answer session. Uh, but this gives a, a bit of an overall update of the organisation. I'll, I'll try to move through the deck reasonably quickly. Look, just, just good to start with a bit of a, an overview of, of the organisation and, and, and of what we describe as our kind of highlights. Uh, which is we have this world-class uh, copper gold asset in the form of Havron and we're in joint venture with the world's largest gold company, Newmont. Uh, we just updated the, the Jork resource in, in December and that's now sitting at 8.4 million ounces and, and continues to have the opportunity to expand. Uh, we sit next to existing infrastructure with the Telfer gold mine uh, that's just about 45 kilometres to, to the west. And as I think a lot of people appreciate, that's coming towards the end of its life. And the Havron ore presents a ready-made kind of uh, new ore feed for that, um, for that mill. Uh, we, we think we really like our exploration footprint. We think we have a lot of option value within that. And in the second half of 2023, we're able to really greatly increase that platform with a farm in agreement with Rio Tinto, where Greatland takes control and is manager of that and has a pathway to 75% ownership of what we think is the best unexplored uh, footprint in the Patterson. Uh, we also have the support of the, the debt banks uh, in the shape of ANZ, ING and HSBC, where we put in place uh, a, a $220 million support based on our 30% ownership of the asset. And of course, we've also bought in Wailu. They're about an 8.5% shareholder now, but occupying that strategic role. And I think really important to the evolution and the opportunities ahead of us as an organisation. Uh, just in terms of the overview of the company, uh, again, I think we continue to expand that um, shareholder base where we have more of a balance between really appreciating and, and valuing the retail presence we have, but also bringing in more and more institutional demand to augment and, uh, and complement that. And I think that's been a, a really useful evolution of the company and, and obviously headed there by uh, Wailu. I like to orientate people around strategy and, and the strategy of the organisation has three very clear kind of horizons. You know, we want to deliver and continue to expand the Havron development. Uh, we want to continue to, to invest in the drill bit and unlock that exploration optionality within the portfolio. And then finally, we also are really disciplined and active around how we can enhance that portfolio uh, in terms of the corporate development and financially disciplined uh, acquisition opportunities. In, in terms of how we think about the organisation, you know, what we've really tried to do is put a, a tier one team together. I think both at the board and the management level, I, I think our board is particularly outstanding. We're uh, led by Mark Barnabar as in the chair role. Uh, Mark is um, former global head of resources for Macquarie Bank, sat on the Reserve Bank of Australia, so our, our Bank of England effectively in Australia. Uh, so, and then we also complement him with Elizabeth Gaines, uh, formerly CEO of $60 billion plus um, Fortescue Group as, as our deputy chair. Uh, and then within the management team, 
Uh, we also have Jimmy Wilson sitting there. Um, he sits on the board, but in an executive director role. He was widely seen as 2IC of BHP, ran a number of divisions there, including the, the iron ore, but, but very much a, an operational um, you know, force there. Uh, myself, my background out of Northern Star and, and other corporates in Australia. Joining me from Northern Star is Simon Tyrrell, uh, who heads our, our operations as a COO role. But you know, the deeper team, uh, Monique, who leads our finance department, uh, Matt Kwan, who went to Oxford and is our general counsel, and Rowan, who also came out of Fortescue but has a legal development in that investor relations and, uh, and business development role. I think it really is an extraordinary team. And through a very, diff a, a very competitive resources market in Australia, I think Greatland has been able to bring together you know, an exceptional team to be a good operator and understand and, and be able to articulate the value of Havron, but also create potential future opportunities for the platform. Uh, I mentioned that we updated the resource in, in December. This took it to 8.4 million ounces. A really important feature of that was there was 5 million uh, ounces of indicated resource. So it moved from inferred up to indicated, which is a higher level of confidence. So five million ounces at 3.1 um, grams, and it's indicated category that has the opportunity to pass across to, to reserves when you update the mine plan. So we think that's a really important feature and a highlight of that. And for good order, we, we do note uh, Newmont just updated its view, albeit under a different, uh, reporting uh, regime being the, the US um, system, the SK1300, but also came out with it effectively a, a very similar and in, indicated resource, which was lovely confirmation. I note the reserve is still 2.9 million ounces at um, 3.7 grams. The next time that um, mine plan is updated, which will likely come out with the feasibility study, I think there's an opportunity to continue to take a lot of that indicated resource into the reserve. The, the next slide we, we really like, it's a really good um, indicator of the last two decades, but, but really this century of expiration in Australia, a tier one jurisdiction. And this is the maiden resource this, um, for each of these discoveries. And you can see it's effectively done by year. But if you look at the, you know, effectively size being the bubble size on the screen, if, if you look at that, the Havron comfortably sits in those top five, top six uh, discoveries of the last couple of years. When you look at it on a grade and size basis, it, it really occupies a very special position indeed. But if you look at um, Tropicana, Central Tanami, Gear, are all some of the highest quality assets in Australia. And I think that just shows you how favourably Havron prints uh, in that space. Now, this is the maiden resource. All of them, including Havron, have, have more than doubled. Uh, Hemi's not in production yet, but I think you know, is an excellent asset with DeGray and I think, I, I think has a very clear pathway to production. But this, it really does, I think, highlight the quality of Havron and the quality of the discovery. Uh, again, this is a similar way of, of looking at the Australian peer group. Uh, and really, again, you see the DeGray asset, um, Hemi, sitting to the, the right of us in terms of uh, uh, size or to the left of screen. But in terms of uh, grade, we're kind of uh, a, a notch up in terms of grade. And we love that combination of really big size, uh, but also really good grade. And, and again, it just underscores why this is put into production on an expedited basis. It's a standout asset. Uh, and overall, that's kind of where we sit within the ASX peer group. We obviously less comparable here in the, in the London market, but certainly in the Australian peer group, you know, we think there's opportunity for continued growth. Just now to, to give an update on the operation itself, uh, when you look at this, uh, this basically shows us continuing to advance the decline. 
We're down about 340 metres vertical. The ore body um, starts about 415, 420 metres. So effectively, we are 80, 81% um, of the advancement uh, complete. I think people recall that we're up to the lower contained uh, aquifer. We've been through the upper contained aquifer. We've been through the middle contained aquifer. We're now down to the last of these aquifers being the, the lower contained aquifer. Just like our progress through the upper and middle aquifer, we punch some um, boreholes into this, we depressurize it, we dewater it, and then once we've got the, the flow rates down to steady state, we're able to um, develop through that. So we, we've stood off that uh, with a, 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 a safety margin that we, we thought was appropriate. We're doing that dewatering um, and depressurization work as we speak. That continues to advance. That decision was taken both by Newcrest and Greatland back, I think, in October um, or so 2021. And, and that same approach, the continuity as Newmont has come. So there's been no change. We continue to think um, uh, that that progresses to plan and, um, and we expect to kind of continue to push through that once we've con um, completed the de depressurization, particularly of that lower contained aquifer. The, the next slide is a good overview of the ore body and, and it's kind of in this uh, block model structure and that, uh, I'm gonna call it a purple color, is effectively that plus three gram element. And it kind of highlights, this is the same ore body from both the north and the west view. It's very much a cylinder kind of shape. But you can see that southeast crescent, that high grade zonation sitting on the outside of it. Um, but the block, the block nature of this lends itself to what sublevel open stoping. These are big 50 metre vertical stopes, and that allows us to have big 125,000 tonne stopes, which leads to a very efficient um, mining process and a lower cost structure. So we love both the grade but we also love just the really blocky, sub-vertical nature of this ore body. With underground mining, gravity is your friend. So we like the fact that it kind of, um, you know, as you mine, it will just drop down into the stoke. So it's a really beautiful um, ore body in terms of it's just been, it looks just perfect, tailor-made to, to, to mine. Uh, again, people are, are familiar with these presentations. No, I love the ounces per vertical um, metre metric. Uh, the dash line there is where it used to be, and you can see it's just continued to improve. It's continued to walk to the, to the right of screen. And when we look at that, our, our focus for the drilling over the last kind of 12 months has really been in that bottom 400 metres of, of the ore body. And that's where you've seen the really significant, um, you know, move in delineated ounces. So this is now um, 7,900, so just under 8,000 ounces per vertical metre across the entire kilometre or 1,000 vertical metres, uh, which is exceptional. It runs a little bit higher than that in, in the top of the ore body. Uh, we really have drilled quite reasonably densely in that top part of the ore body because that's where we'll first mine. We've now put some drilling into that um, into that bottom ore body, not the same level of density. That middle area probably is a bit unloved because there's the drills that target the top and there's the drills that target the bottom. Obviously, they transit through the middle area from time to time, but less of a designated um, uh, approach there or a targeted approach, but it still looks really good. So we, we, there's obviously natural variation, but the average and the overall ounces per vertical metre is extraordinary. And if you think about it, every 1,000, um, every one metre of vertical d development, we're able to access up to 8,000 um, ounces higher in, in some places. So mm -hmm. that just talks to the economics of this ore body in terms of average cost or all in sustaining cost per ounce, but also the capital in it efficiency or intensity of this ore body, particularly once we're through that, um, that permium sequence at top, this ore body is incredibly efficient. 
when you put in development capex, it leads straight to ounces. Um, this just shows that ore body, the blue being the, the original um, reserve. We really like to think as we update that mine plan, there's an opportunity to, to grow that. And you can see that indicated resource in the red really dovetails along those high grade structures around that existing um, uh, ore, ore, ore body, around the existing infrastructure in terms of the decline down. So we think there's a really good um, opportunity to convert that indicated resource into, uh, into reserve. The last time we did the update, the conversion rate was 86%. That is again exceptional. It talks to the quality of the ore body. And we think there's another great opportunity to show really significant and superior conversion of resource to reserve as we update that, that mine plan. Uh, just changing tack to, to just to kind of close out around the expiration. Uh, this is the existing footprint. Uh, the red area was what we added late last year with um, the Rio Tinto joint venture. So you can see the, the sheer size of that tenement and the work, the geotechnical work that um, Rio Tinto did across that platform or that footprint is exceptional. And we have the opportunity to take advantage of that. Uh, obviously, in the, um, there's Telford there, 45 kilometres across to the west is Havron. Uh, we, uh, straight along strike from that is, is the black box there, um, Scallywag. Uh, we're really excited about the opportunity to drill that in the, in the year ahead. Um, so that's a really high quality um, target for us, together with some of the South Patterson or the Rio Tinto um, joint venture ground. And where we've used that green um, circumference, I, I think that just shows you it's a 60 kilometre circumference around Telfer. Firstly, I think that's a reasonable approximation of what can be a truckable distance. But secondly, we have an Indigenous land use agreement inside that 60 kilometre zonation. So these are, this is an area that's basically within the centre of gravity of that existing Telfer mill. And you can see that's where a lot of our tenements sit, which reduces the bar for what you need as a discovery to take it into production, to take advantage of that existing infrastructure in the, in the Patterson. Uh, just more broadly in the portfolio, it's actually been quite an, an active um, period for us over the last 12 months at, within the, the rest of the portfolio. Ernest Giles, I think everyone appreciates that. That's a very high quality um, opportunity for us. Arkean Greenstone, which is something like 70% of the gold pour in, in Western Australia, think the super pit, uh, Tropicana, a number of the assets that we talked about on that um, previous slide of high quality Australian discoveries. This was sitting undercover, not identified as an Archean Greenstone. We're really excited about that. We did a couple of EIS, that means co-sponsored with government funding, um, holes to it very late last year after of finally achieving a land access agreement with the Indigenous people there. We're really excited about the prospect of drilling there in 2024. Um, Panorama, uh, we actually had, you know, we've explored for gold, but we were also aware that it was prospective for base um, metals. Do, do we have some really interesting um, surface uh, information around nickel up there, um, which I think we want to understand because that can create optionality for value. So that's something to spend some time on. And we have been on the ground in Bromus um, recently. It's a pretty active area, that Bromus area right now. So we continue to both be interested in it for ourselves and have some inbound inquiries about working with us on that. So we like to think about our portfolio. We like to be active managers of our portfolio. So all of these assets, we either want to kind of unlock value through our exploration efforts or think about other ways to unlock um, value as well for shareholders. So look, in, in summary, um, this gives you a really good overview of, of the platform. We think, you know, Havron, it's around these three horizons. You know, Havron continues to be a focus for us. We want to deliver that project on time, but also to expand it. We want to continue to invest in exploration. We love the portfolio. We've expanded the portfolio 
and we think that increases our optionality and our option to or our, our potential to create value there. And then finally, we think we're well positioned with the strategic investment, the evolution of our shareholder base, the support of banks to optimise the opportunities for this platform. Um, so with that, Donald, I'll, I'll pass back to you and we can um, open it up for some questions. Okay, that's lovely, Sean. Thank you so much indeed for your presentation there. Um, let's start at the start by asking you about Newmont's decision to divest of both Haveron and Telfer. Uh, my, my first question, what's your view on that decision? Did this come as a surprise to the Greatland, Greatland team? And are you disappointed Newmont doesn't actually want to keep Haveron? Yeah, well, look, um, well, look, firstly, let me probably approach that just from a, 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 an overview perspective. Um, look, we're, we're very aware of, of Newmont's Q4 announcement, where they described that they were going to, um, where they, they signalled that six operating assets were non-core plus two development assets. So eight assets. Um, so that's a really significant change for them. And, and they want to create a portfolio of 10, you know, very large tier one assets, a, a really unique global portfolio. And, and, and I can understand that approach. And it's a, you know, it, it does create an amazing um, Newmont um, platform. In terms of kind of being uh, with you today, look, th this is kind of a, a long standing commitment, as you know, to, to be across in London this week. So, so organising this engagement with shareholders was somewhat put in place ahead of that. And I will do the best I can to kind of answer questions on that. But I'm also mindful that we're in a, a, a listed company um, environment. We're not trying to um, add to or cultivate speculation. In fact, we, we have a, a policy where we, we try not to comment on market um, speculation. And we really want to kind of use the RNS platform to communicate to shareholders um, any new information so everyone has access to that um, at the same time. H having said that, um, you know, we, we also think you know, Newmont's a large, really capable um, organisation. Although they've described these eight assets as non-core, that's not going to materialise uh, an outcome on them uh, immediately. Ultimately, that timing is up to Newmont but it's going to evolve over the course of the year. And, and of course, as, as Tom Palmer said in some of his comments, even these assets that are non-core are still world-class assets. It's a fantastic base and it's testimony to Newmont that they would consider divesting some of these assets. And I'm not just talking about our asset, I'm talking about a number of those assets um, that will be highly prized by most of the rest of, of the sector and again, I think that's just testament to their, their quality. But, but overall, you know, we, we love the op opportunity that gives us and we're, and we're really interested to understand how that evolves. So, so maybe more specifically to your, your question, look, we, we weren't surprised by this. Um, we, we understood and, and, and speak to Newmont in the ordinary course of the joint venture really regularly. Um, we understand their definition of tier one asset, which I, I think is around lowest half cash cost, plus 10 year life, over 500,000 ounces per annum production profile. Now, Haveron probably ticks two of those three boxes, but not necessarily all three. And I think previously I've spoken to people that my view when Newmont came in, they would be decisive. They would either fall in love with the asset or, or they would seek to rationalise their portfolio. And, and I think that's exactly what they've done. Now, that will, that will kind of reveal itself o over time, but I think the opportunity for, for us is, is really significant from that. So, um, yeah, we, we view it positively. Okay, so uh, John Rolfe, is, that's his question more or less answered there. He says, does this really mean Haveron is no longer a tier one asset? And uh, I suppose, has this changed your view in any way? Uh, just a brief answer on that, because you have, you have mainly answered it already. Yeah, our, our, our view is there's no change in Haveron. Like, you know, we want to see it developed and optimised for the benefit of all, all stakeholders. You know, perhaps it doesn't do exactly 500,000 ounces per year, but it's still a really significant high quality asset. And I don't think that view changes either at Newmont or at Greatland. It's just not one of the 15 largest assets on the planet. 
Okay, and as a following question, Alex Soros asks, when will Newmont begin the Havron Telford divestment process? So when, when does it begin? Uh, and I suppose how long will it take? And what are the options available to Greatland Gold? And a direct question for you, Sean. I know you said you didn't really want to take such, such challenges, but well, why not? Uh, would Greatland buy Havron and Telfer? Okay, there's, there's a, a little bit to un unpack there. So I, I think in terms of you know, the, the timing from Newmont, and, and obviously, look, they've come out and said they want to you know, rationalise eight assets over the course of the, the next year. But, but having said that, Rome's not built in a day. There will be time to organise that process. And I imagine it's actually, they've got a pretty busy, busy business development team right now um, as, as, as that plan has been kind of revealed to the market. But, but overall, I, I think we also understand the centre of gravity of their divestments. I think there's some um, six uh, assets up in North America. That's probably the centre of gravity for them. And, and my understanding is that's, that's they're going to be their initial focus. Um, you know, ha having said that, you know, we are certainly interested on the right terms. On, on acquiring that asset. And what we want any acquisition, acquisition to be is accretive to our shareholders. Uh, I, I think in terms of Telfer, um, look, I, I think we're, we're really benefit here from we can go either way. I think Havron is such a good quality ore body. It can be developed on a standalone basis. Um, and that's a really at attractive proposition. Um, a fit for purpose next to mine mouth um, processing capacity is, is certainly achievable. Having said that, you're also in a region where Telfer sits next door, existing infrastructure available. Of, of course, that's a, a sensible and um, a way to think about unlocking value from, from Havron. I think ultimately it's up to Newmont whether they want to sell them as a package or, or together. But, but I think it's probably, um, it, it, it's probably something where you'd expect when you look at the way Newmont treats the assets in their accounts, when you look at the way the independent expert um, approached them, they looked at the assets on a combined basis. So that might be your starting point. But ultimately, Greatland has, we think, have a choice and we think there's a pathway to success either way. Okay, crikey, that was an interesting answer. Um, yes, uh, Dipsard mentioned the, that Great and Gold have the legal right of last refusal over that 70% of Havron being divested. Uh, does this affect the valuation of Havron? How important will it prove to be in the negotiations, do you think? I mean, it basically means that you can come in and match any, any bidder. You get the last, the last opportunity to match the bidder at, the, at that final price. Over to you, Sean. Well, it's good, good to see Dipsard um, reviewed the, the half-year accounts this morning. So I'm um, pleased, to, pleased to see his work there because um, we, did, we did mention that in it. And I think it, it, it does give us this, this right to match. So if a, a process is run, we can um, determine the outcome at, 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 the, at the end of that process. We can't miss out. Um, so that's a really advantageous position to be in. And that's not unusual in a joint venture um, structure that you would respect. And in the ordinary course of business, your first and, and most expected kind of outcome would be for the other joint venture party to consolidate the other or, you know, it, it, or vice versa. Um, so we, we think it's a, a really strong position for, for Greatland to have. Um, and importantly, what it does is probably also make it a little less attractive for other people to spend a whole lot of time, energy and effort looking at this because they know ultimately we will sit there and have the right to buy it even at a price or on terms that someone else negotiates. So we think it's a, a strong position to be. But Donald, what I'd probably emphasise here is the relationship um, that we have with Newmont. Look, we're relationship driven. Uh, we've built a really good relationship um, with them since they've since they've taken over that joint venture role, I've previously known them, so it's been a long-standing relationship as far as I'm concerned. And we think the best way to to success isn't necessarily kind of to to rely on the terms of the joint venture or any other aspect. We honestly think you know we'll treat each other with respect. Newmont's a magnificent organisation. I, I think they're going to treat us with respect, and I think. 
without getting, yeah, like we're really pleased with the position we have, but fundamentally I think there's a pathway where there's a good outcome for Newmont and Greatland shareholders, that's based on the new, mutual respect. And that's all we've seen from Newmont is just what a you know, terrific organisation they are, what a terrific culture they have. And we find them a really good fit for, for, for um, Greatland. Okay, big question from Alan Bauer, Dipsard and several others. Um, if Greatland can raise sufficient funds to buy Telfer and Haverham from Newman outright, uh, that, that's a, an if, I suppose. And also, what are the capex costs for the remaining mine development, which uh, remains to be done at Haverham? And the third element to it, might it be prudent to share the risks and costs with Wailu and others? Yeah, look, there's, uh, again, that's one of these multi barreled questions, so a, a little bit to unpack. But Look, I, I think it takes back to this being an, an accretive acquisition. And, and what I mean by an accretive acquisition, if, if you hold one share in, in Greatland today, you, you own a, a certain proportion of our 30%. What we'd like at the end, if a transaction came about where we consolidated ownership of, uh, of Havron, and that's an if, of course, but if it did, um, we'd like that one share to hold a greater individual portion of, of, of Havron. So your one share would own more than Havron after the transaction than beforehand. So ostensibly should be, or at face value should be more value, valuable. So that's the way we think about it. We think financially disciplined accretive um, acquisition is, is sensible. Um, and when you do accretive acquisitions, we think the opportunity for the market to support you is, is there and there's a long history of that. And I think by adding the institutional um, kind, of plat, uh, kind of holdings to, to our um, share registry, I, I think makes that more achievable as well. And that's been part of the, us trying to mature the, the Greatland platform o over the last three, three years. I think part of that as well, that there was a reference to Wailu there, I think part of that is having Wailu there. I think Wailu hugely add to our financial credibility. The, you know, they're an organisation that enjoys a great reputation. They're, they're very well funded, um, you know, with one of Australia's wealthiest um, people behind them. It's, it's a great platform to have in your corner. And I think what you've seen is their interest and support of us has been as a shareholder at the corporate level. So yeah, look, I, I'm you know we love options, we love understanding how we can do things better, but really we see their role being at that share level, being at the same level as I am as as a number of the people listening here today as shareholders, and they want to optimise that share value. So we think there's great alignment there, and there's an opportunity to 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 work together. Um, so so we think in essence uh, there's a path to success here, and. And certainly the work we've done in maturing the platform, the team we've put in place both at a board and a management level, the share registry we've done, the bank support we have in place and the strategic holder in, um, in Wailu all make us more credible as a financial um, counterparty on, on any asset we look at. Okay, Sean, which takes us uh, uh, neatly to Telfer. Can you take us through the potential purchase of Telfer, please, Sean? Is Havron economic without it? And how do you deal with the liabilities associated with Telfer? Yeah, well, look, to, to some extent, I, I spoke about um, the choice we have before, where I, I think Havron can be really attractive um, either way, or although I think the most likely outcome is from a Newmont perspective that they'll, if they're looking to tidy up their portfolio, that they might think of them as a, as a single asset. But, but we don't know the mind of Newmont and I think we can be, you know, we can see value under either scenario. But, you know, when we, we think about Telfer, we, we also think about that's a, a, a mine in a very different stage of its life cycle to Havron. Like Havron has all of its best days ahead of it. We're excited about a multi-decade future there. By contrast, Telfer has been a top five Australian gold mine for some 30 of its 35 years, but father time captures everyone and uh, including Telfer. You know, it's 
as, as we understand it, it, it's kind of trending towards the end of its life. Now, that's actually very complementary in, in many ways with, with Havron and, and the Havron discovery. Um, but, but, yeah, it is, it is a very different thought process and it does come with some um, rehab liabilities. We'd rather those you know, liabilities not be there. Having said that, if, um, if that we think about the net value of the two assets combined. So without really knowing intimately um, Telfa, if you have a view that Havron has a positive value, but Telfa has a very small value or, a, or even a negative value, you're only paying the next net value which reflects that those liabilities. So I, I don't see it as um, concerning for us. I see it as part of a very thorough due diligence. I see it making sure you calibrate um, that value. And in some ways it allows you to buy Havron cheaper than you otherwise would. So I, I, I see it as like all things, there's, there's benefits and, um, you know, and issues associated, but on balance, I think it's a very manageable scenario. Okay, Sean, that was a very considered answer. I wouldn't expect anything less of you, of course. Uh, a question, next question from Mark Hennessy. What cost savings and efficiencies would Grayton like to implement at Telfer? And John Doyle's getting involved as well. He, he uh, asks, can you see any additional value which might be extracted? So cost savings and additional value. Yeah, look, I, I, I think like, the way I might answer this question is to go back to my experience at, at Northern Star. And Northern Star acquired um, Kananabel, East Kandana, Plutonic, Jundee uh, from a combination of Barrick and, um, and, and Newmont. So, so that sounds familiar. And, and I have direct experience you know, around the integration of those assets, the, the cost efficiency and the, and the revitalisation of those assets. They were well run assets by global majors run safely and well, but there's a different time in a cycle where a, a, a mid cap who's laser focused on an asset can just sweat them a little bit harder and can look for those cost savings, use those cost savings to reinvigorate the mine plan. And that's what we were able to, to do at Northern Star. I, I think hugely successfully, Northern Star is now the largest gold company in Australia. Um, it's worth some um, 10, 12, 15 billion dollars uh, without looking at the market cap today. And, and built off a number of you know, low 100 million dollar transactions. So the value creation, the uplift of value for shareholders was, was remarkable. So this is a well trodden path in terms of juniors being able to come in look at assets and on occasions being able to drive those um, cost efficiencies and being able to um, unlock value of, of mine life because you're willing to go in there and do some of the, you know, the, the smaller opportunities to, to um, bring out new mine life and, and open up new parts of the ore body. And, and even if the heyday is behind it, um, there's still an opportunity to create value. So I, I think I've got and a number of members of my team have direct experience on that. And, and so, you know, we're excited about the opportunities that affords. Great. OK, so I'm going to use the words if uh, initially, and then I'm going to use the word accretive. Uh, secondly, uh, would an acquisition be diluted to existing shoulder, shareholders in the short term, Sean? And then Dave Harris asks, what medium to long term value might the purchase of Havron Telford deliver for shareholders? So if and then accretive. Well, look, look, my, you, you know, when we talk about the strategy, and one of the reasons I always love to orientate people around strategy is that it gives you an overview of our perspective on how we want to take the company forward. And we've always talked about that, that third horizon being financially disciplined growth. So that's growth that we think creates value for shareholders. And that's about it being accretive. Um, so in this case, it's, it, you know, you're not buying a new asset and, and it can sometimes be difficult to compare apples and oranges. We've got a bag full of three apples and we're buying another seven apples. Well, it, in that scenario, I think people can understand whether 
their share of that bag is more or less um, apples. So if I, if I continue that somewhat clumsy analogy. So I, I think we would definitely view this as being accretive in the short term and accretive to value and shareholder value in the long term. And that would be the driver for us wanting to transact. Okay, Ken Emmott asks an interesting question uh, in, in, in all this big picture stuff. He says, what happens to the jury JV? Does the Newcrest 50% uh, share get sold with Havron and Telfer? Uh, and if Newmont are divesting, presumably they don't want 50% uh, of jury. Yeah, look, I, I, I think again, I, you know, we can't comment on, on, on what is the mind of Newmont. We've certainly spent time with their expiration team as you know, particularly over the last two, three months. And it's fair to say, I, I think their exploration team, you know, really likes the Patterson. Um, so, you know, perhaps they're still in love with it and their exploration team wants to, to hold on to that. Or perhaps for a global major that's exiting the infrastructure in, the, in, in, that, um, in that Patterson region, they exit comprehensively. Certainly we'd be interested in, in everything in the Patterson that's you know that's our center of gravity there uh we'd love to get back the jury there's some high quality targets that we're that we'd love to get on ground and and drill um we'd love to do that with newmont but we'd also love to lead that ourselves so uh it's certainly from our point of view something we would be interested in but perhaps a better question to newmont until we they they reveal exactly what their approach is going to be and the timing of that Okay, here's one that you, I'm sure, will have expected to come up. Uh, Matthew Billingham asks, uh, he'd like to know if Greatland will be listing on ASX this year and if listing might be dilutive for shareholders. Look, again, I think, yeah, I, I think we still think the ASX market potentially, you know, makes a lot of sense for um, Greatland shareholders. And, and just to be clear, we value and celebrate what we have here in London. So when we speak about or we get a question about ASX, it should be very clearly understood that we would remain listed here in London. It would be about augmenting that with an uh, ASX listing. And we think it's attractive if we feel we can bring demand from Australia to as additional buyers of Greatland stock. Um, I, it's actually interesting. There are some reforms in the London market right now, which, which I, I actually think are, are, are really sensible reforms. Um, and it probably does allow um, Greatland to think about whether that is fit for purpose for us, um, because that, that, that is a pathway to get um, index buying as well, which the ASX also offers. So I, I think it's where we, we can think about both pathways now, maybe a little bit more um, than before. But if you believe which, which I think on balance I still do, that the ASX would bring in additional buyers. I think it's still really interesting to us. I, I think in 2023, we, we effectively completed that process with the ASX and had a pathway to list. We didn't think it, given the, the conditions of that, we felt it, it, it wasn't accretive to shareholders, so therefore we didn't um, execute it. We did a lot of work and we think we continue to benefit from that work. But ultimately, we don't want to make a decision that we don't think ultimately increases the value of our share price. So people should have confidence we have that discipline and that overlay of, of what's important. Um, and, and similarly, you know, I, I think if, you know, it's given we've, we've talked about the potential for, for Newmont to, to divest Havron and and potentially that to it to involve Greatland, I, th I think we'd probably let that play out before we we necessarily made a move to the ASX or indeed to a different part of the London exchange. I think it'd be good to um, to understand the platform and, and where it presently sits before we start um, making any changes to what is already you know we think a, a, a fantastic company. Okay, yeah, that's a very interesting answer and slightly different from uh, the one that you gave uh, uh, to it previously, so I'm intrigued by that. Okay, uh, let's turn to some more operational questions. Uh, and here we go. This is, this is today's favourite question by a mile. And it's not the new one question, actually. It's uh, the, the aquifer. Alan Redwood, Dipsard, uh, Wendy Ward, Alan Bauer, Philip Cookson, Steve Williams, all ask about the aquifer. I mean, basically they're saying, uh, 
has the lower aquifer been dewatered de yet? I think you indicated it was still work in progress. And if so, when will drilling restart? Will drilling restart? And will the water cause any long-term problems? So I've, I've sort of bundled all those questions into one, really. No, look, it, it's good to unpack. And I, I did try to talk this a little bit um, on, on the slide, but, but let me augment that. So um, the dewatering continues. There's, there's no change in the, and the depressurisation from memory. There's uh, six boreholes into it, uh, which is extracting um, that water. Um, look, this is always expected to take us into the, the, the second half of the year when we first articulated it. There's no change. As we sit here today, I, I don't think I've received any information which suggests that it would take longer or that the flow rates are higher. At, at the margin, I think you know, we've received, um, at least anecdotally, pretty um, uh, you know, positive um, indications of where um, that's headed. Um, I, I think importantly, though, a, a, you know, we, in parallel with that depressurisation and dewatering um, process, uh, we, we gather data, we, we gather flow rates, we, we get an understanding, and then that needs to be effectively reassessed in a model um, to, to recalibrate for the actual flow rates we're seeing from those boreholes bore as opposed to like the initial um, test boreholes. So we think you know, that's you know, a, a positive to have more information. We think once we have that information, we can recalibrate and, and give um, more definitive guidance. But right now, I don't see there being any changes to where we spoke um, you know, when we first talked to the market about this, in, well, I'll just say in the December quarter of 2023, where we see the dewatering and depressurisation just continuing into that um, uh, second half of the year. And, and I don't see this being particularly different to how we tackled the upper contained aquifer or the middle contained aquifer the approach to the lower contained aquifer is exactly the same. It's punch into it, put some boreholes in, depressurise, dewater, get flow rates down to their sustainable level, set up the pumping infrastructure and then drive through it as you do with any mine that generates um, water, which is most mines in Australia because aquifers are, are just a part of the landscape. But you know, the, the flow rates at this mine are not particularly high. Um, so I, I think, you know, timing's always um, so, something people have a focus on. But I think from a technical risk, this is, is a pretty understood feature in the Australian underground mining landscape. OK, that was a, a comprehensive answer, Sean. Uh, the same people ask, and here's, here are a couple of big ones. Uh, when will the feasibility study be released? Uh, you're, you said in the half yearly report that you're working on it. Uh, when can we expect first ore? So there's two questions for you. The feasibility study to be released and when do we expect first ore? Yeah, look, I, I think we think about the feasibility study coming out in, in the second um, half of, of the year. Obviously, we do that in you know, conjunction and together with our joint venture partner. Um, Newmont, obviously a, a big part of this piece has been around, you know, there, there's potentially some movement there. Uh, how, how does that impact it? Does it accelerate? Does it slow it down? Or just, you know, right now our view is it remains on track. We think with the updated resource, there's an opportunity to increase the reserve potentially with the updated feasibility study, which we think is another really positive for our shareholders but also for Newmont in terms of their understanding of the asset. And um, so I, I think it just continues to, um, you know, to progress. And, you know, I, and I think that feasibility study ultimately dictates the, the final development timetable for, for Havron. But, it, but again, I think it's all pretty consistent with, um, you know, with how we've seen it to date. If, um, if, if, those, if, if you're back into the second half of the year, I'm, hearing, I'm seeing the questions coming flying in live, does that actually delay first ore? Well, I, I think what we've talked about is dewatering to the second half of the year and then the sequence being then recommencing the decline and getting down to the, the top of the ore body. There, I, I think I've explained to people before, you know, being in line with the top of the ore body, you still need to decline down. You put in your drives. There, there is a time frame with that, but also the country rock. 
So the, the rock below that permian level is beautiful ground conditions. Um, so once you're in that, you'll see really efficient um, mining processes. You'll be able to accelerate that and get that set up um, really um, smartly. And first ore presumably will actually be uh, development ore, which is basically those drives going in, setting up the stopes to then bring down the, the stopes above them. But that development ore is typically your first ore. Okay, 10 minutes to go on the webinar. Nick Taylor says, last year you suggested the possibility of a top hat company in Australia, which could potentially save a great deal of time and money by avoiding having to double up on legal advice in the UK and Australia, amongst other things. What are your views on that? And how would it affect shareholders? Yeah, well, look, I, I've, I've talked about the, the ASX listing and, and you know, we, we try to think about that uh, you know, from what is supportive of shareholder price, what creates shareholder demand, and, and that's the way we think about the, the ASX listing. As, as fine tuning of that, um, we obviously want to create the, the most cost effective, efficient platform we can. And, and if we believe that having um, top hatting it with an Australian entity, so you don't, presently we kind of operate in Australia, plus we have our, our head office here in, in London, so we kind of end up doubling up on a lot of legal and accounting bills. You know, we do the work in Australia, then we redo it in London, or you have to check at least that the jurisdiction is the same for both. If, if our advice continues to be in whatever circumstances we are, that it is a cost saving element to consolidate the corporate vehicle in Australia, notwithstanding we've still got the London listing, I, I think of course we're going to try to think about what what is the most efficient, what saves the most amount of money, what drives the biggest bang for shareholder buck. So I, I think that's the way we think about it. We're not pre-baked on it, but it, certainly last time, I think the advice was, hey, you can save money if you consolidate your, your, your legal and tax advice in, into Australia. Maybe bad for you know, the local uh, law firms, but, but good for us putting more money into the ground. Okay. Um Exploration questions. Now, you dealt with exploration uh, quite extensively in the half yearly results. So if people haven't seen those half yearly results, I would very much uh, uh, recommend they have a read of them because it, it, there's some absolutely fascinating information in there. Uh, Jamie Kelly, amongst others, Jamie Kelly has just asked a live question. Uh, and let, let, let him, his answer be wrapped up into this. Uh, Greatland have been busy with early stage exploration drilling with results back from the 100% owned Scallywag tenement, the Patterson South Rio Tinto farm, farm in, which you said was, was excellent, uh, uh, unexplored uh, Patterson, 100% owned Ernest Giles, which I know you've got a very soft spot, and with strong prospectivity for nickel at Panorama. So I, could I ask you just a broad question? What do you actually make of these uh, early drill results? How promising are they? What will come of them? Look, look, um, look we, we, you know, we obviously you know, really like uh, the optionality in that exploration portfolio. I, I think it's got better uh, over the last um, you know, 12, 24 months as we've obviously just bringing in that huge amount of um, land holding, which is reasonably developed in terms of thought with the geophysics and, and target work, targeting work that Rio Tinto did. And, and that's a great credit to their organisation. They're super impressive. And we really also appreciate the time that Rio Tinto exploration team has spent with our team to discuss um, targets. You know, I think they've had some good ideas. We've had some good ideas. But mostly the two, 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 two teams have actually had a, a pretty common um, view on targeting opportunities. So look, we think there's some really good targets through that um, South Patterson Rio Tinto joint venture. I think some of the work we've done on um, Scallywag is really positive. You know, we've, we've kind of had this anomaly, we've kind of crept up on it a little bit, but that is the detective game that we're in, um, in geology, particularly undercover, using these different techniques to continue to kind of zero in on, on where the anomaly is. And so we, we feel um, the, the next campaign there at Scallywag, potentially you know, either at further zeros in the target or ideally we, we, we can test it. Um, and so we're, we're really excited about those elements in the Patterson, which is, our, you know, that's our core ground. Uh, Ernest Giles, 
yeah, you know, it's it's just as good. Uh, it doesn't have the infrastructure around it, but our key in Greenstone, it lights up on geophysics. We're really excited about getting into there in, in 2024 and having those initial holes, understanding the stratigraphy better, getting some feedback, recalibrating um, from that EIS funded um, uh, quick two drill holes that we managed to sneak into to 2023, I, I think are really helpful in that regard. And, and the team is kind of recalibrating that as we speak. Um, you know, uh, panoramas are a little bit interesting. Like we, we probably went out there looking for gold and got nickel. Um, but that's Is that good. a good or a bad thing? I, I, disappointed. Well, <laughs> it's, it's good. Like certainly um, it's better to have, um, to have discovery regardless of, of, of commodity. And, and we think there are plenty of pathways to create value from that. Um, that's not to say we wouldn't keep it, but there are other, other options for us to create value. And I think we can create that value by continuing to do some you know, baseline work there to, to further refine or test some of those targets. It's not going to be the focus that the Patterson is or that Ernest Giles is, but I think we continue to see an, uh, an opportunity to create value. Um, Bromus, we actually did some time on ground there, I think actually for the first time. So that's been in the portfolio for a long time, but never really had a lot of attention. Um, I certainly have a philosophy that that we don't want to hold ground for the sake of it. We want to test it. We want to make a decision. We either want to fall in love with it and find discoveries on it, or we're actually happy to let it go and trade up to to, to ground that we think is more prospective. We we have people want to come and talk to us about Bromus because that that kind of postcode has become has had quite a lot of activity in that area around nickel, gold, lithium, there's some act action around there. So we, again, we like the idea of unlocking that value ourselves. We think we have a really capable exploration team uh, led by Damien, which I think some people have been able to hear, hear on um, some of our presentations. You know, he's a, 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 you know, a great person, but equally a great geologist. Um, so we're excited about what that team can unlock. But we're also open to good ideas. If people want to come and talk to us about it, we're, we're also open on that. And that's across our ground. But obviously, we really like holding that core ground 100% as well. But it's, it's good to have choices. OK. Now, we've just got a few minutes left. It's only fair that we uh, let the people who want to talk about the share price uh, have an answer. Uh, the share price was as high as 11.5p in early December, and is now, which it, it went from 6p to 11.5p in early December, and it's now back to 6.45p today, giving a market cap £330 million. Jonathan Dixon, Adrian McManus, Paul Summers, Shaquille Khan, Ross Davies, they're all asking about the share price. Different, different versions of the same share price question. Uh, Shaquille puts it beautifully. He says, why is the share price low? There you go. Why is well, the share price low, Sean? <laughs> we, we fully appreciate the the importance of share price. Um, you know, I've 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 bought shares during um, my period here, and that's a, a meaningful position for me. Um, you know, plus I've, um, there are some incentive plans which are structured around creating value for shareholders. So, no one is more aligned, both at a board level and at the management team level, of getting that um, share price up. Yeah, that's one of the reasons why we, we engage with the market, including today's event. Um, look, we, we tend to have tracked the um, Vanek Junior Gold um, Mines e ETF I index. We've had periods where we've outperformed it and underperformed it, but directionally, um, you know, we've, we've been somewhat um, trending with that. Uh, I think you know, we like the fact that gold has just kind of broken through twenty twenty one $2,100 US an ounce. I, I haven't looked at the gold price in the last couple of hours, but that's, I think, super positive from, from our perspective. Um, and, and I think in a couple of my answers today, I've talked about we look through actions through the prism of being accretive, whether that's an ASX listing, whether it's an acquisition, whether it's expiration, we, we do think about it through the prism of does this create shareholder value? So, you know, we're, we're really laser focused on that. Um, and, and we think there's been, Greatland's probably had more than its fair share of uncertainty over the last, uh, 
uh, year or three kind of within the joint venture um, structures. I, I, I'm really pleased to say that, you know, perhaps there's now a pathway um, where we emerge from that. And, and I think that's a really, you know, interesting opportunity. I think it's a potentially value accretive opportunity. And, and I think things that add certainty. So tidying up the long-term ownership of, of Havron, uh, I think adds to certainty and that's the environment which can support share price. So we like directionally where it's headed, um, but I think it's a really good question and, and people should rest assured we think about it and we want to spend time, time, effort and energy to increase the share price. Okay, now let me just very quickly tell you that we've had a peak of 521 people on here uh, uh, this afternoon and of those, 97% uh, 97 are investors in Greatland Gold with only 3% not. And of those, they break down into the, the, the various classes, 20% describe themselves as high net worth, 10% as sophisticated investors, 70% as the, the great unwashed, the retail investors. So uh, thank you very much indeed to you all for telling us that information. Isn't that absolutely fascinating? And okay, so final question from Terry Downs. Terry, take a bow, you get the last question. Uh, Sean, it looks like great things could be coming Greatland's way. My question is, was the outcome of recent events with Newcrest ever a future event that you and the board had quietly wished for? Uh, look, th thanks for the question, Terry. Um, look, I, I think we've already said it wasn't a surprise, but I, I think people who you know, have followed the Greatland story over the last couple of years appreciate that I've, I've sought to build a, a management team a board, a shareholder base, a debt back, backers um, with the banking syndicate and indeed bringing in the Wailu to mature the platform and give us every opportunity to take advantage of the situations and developments that arise. And, and I think you, you know, an opportunity to do an accretive transaction I think is always a really welcome development. And I think we have a uniquely positioned in terms of our information and understanding of Havron, the contractual rights we have and the team we've assembled, a lot of which actually have deep experience at Telfer in addition to their experience on Havron. I think we've set up the platform the best it can be to take advantage of the opportunity that we hoped would eventuate. Sean, that's it for today. We've come to the end of our time. Thank you so much uh, for uh, being so patient and answering all our questions. Uh, that's it for the March 2024 Town Hall afternoon. A huge thanks to, to you, Sean. Um, and uh, uh, we really do appreciate the level of depth at which you, you answer these questions. Uh, a huge thanks to you all for attending today and asking all those excellent questions which Sean has just been answering. Thank you so much and goodbye from the March Town Hall webinar.